the business case for humor is is huge i would have thought because if you get it right you can win people over i mean uh, one person standing on a stage can fill a stadium with this weird thing that is comedy Welcome to the Humorology podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the world of business, sport and entertainment who are going to share their wisdom and their sense of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. Our guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is the multi-award winning radio host, journalist and presenter of the second longest running show on LBC Radio. Considered a legend by peers and listeners alike, his smooth and seemingly effortless skills showcase his supreme sense of how to flip seamlessly from the serious to the satirical. Early in his career, he developed an extraordinary on-air relationship with comedy superstar Peter Cook, who would regularly call into his show. As the Observer newspaper stated, there's no one quite like him. You get the impression that he's living just a bit dangerously, and that's what makes phone-ins exciting. Clive Bull, welcome to the Humorology podcast. Oh, thank you very much. Wow, what a what an introduction. Nobody quite like him. That could go either way, couldn't it? <laughs> I'm sure it will go the right way. Now, you've been at the top of the uh, radio world for, for, for decades, literally. How important is humour in staying at the top? Yeah, I th I don't know whether I'm at the top or in the middle or somewhere, but uh, uh, I think humour is a vital part, possibly because even when you're doing quite serious stuff at the moment, of course, you know, the news, the world, everything is rather serious. But even then, you do need to retain some kind of sense of humour. Um and I think that just kind of not only on the air, but actually off the air as well. It, uh, if you're good humoured about it, then people want to work with you as well. That's very interesting, actually, because it's I think that level of somebody who has been so long uh, in, on the radio, there must be something happening off air as well as on air that you get on with people. Is, is that humour is important to that as well? Absolutely. Yes. I always think that's that's the most vital thing, really, is getting on with your team. I've always found that really important. I mean, there are people who um, focus just on on the the work in hand and, uh, you know, their minions do whatever whatever they have to do. But I feel like, you know, you have to kind of hold each other's hands and, and get through it as a team. That's that's the way I like to do it anyway. And you've got to enjoy it if you don't enjoy it. You, you can tell. I mean, as you said, there are some people who think that they can bully their way um, to success. And, to, mm. you know, you use the word minions. I think that's, you know, an attitude. And uh, the Humorology mm. podcast is all about attitude towards a lightness, a humor. Um, and and what you're saying is that have you seen um, no names, no pact drill, Clive, but mm. have you seen presenters who have uh, been ousted basically because they weren't liked not not at the radio station where i am now but i do the, the thing is there are one or two people around both in television and radio and and everybody kind of knows who they are there's just one or two who are not uh they are a bit bullying yeah and and they don't have a sense of humor about it and um and everybody knows it and it it really isn't a good idea because the whole industry knows it then and, and people don't really want to work with you. And there, there are one or two, um, in, especially in television. Uh, so I'm told. <laughs> yes, having worked in television a lot, I, I could tell you a lot of stories. <laughs> but we, I bet. But, but we might have to call our lawyers. Yeah. Um, but actually, the people who are really, really successful and are at the top of their game, I do find um, 
are the ones who are incredibly nice and incredibly good humoured. Uh, and it is really noticeable. Some of the very biggest stars you meet, you, you're rather disarmed by their uh, their general humour. Well, who is the biggest star that you've met whose humour you were dis- disarmed by? Ooh, crikey, that's that. That's a really hard one. You know, I mean, mostly I don't tend to meet big stars, um, but I suppose in in, in the humour world, Billy Crystal. I think probably oh. was one of the biggest stars I interviewed. Uh, he's I a legend, that, you know. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, he was. He was just naturally funny. He's one of those people who um, who's just got it. And I, I was, I was next in line. You know how you, uh, they, it's like ten minutes each or whatever. And so I, I, I went in and said, uh, Billy, so you're uh, here to uh, promote your your latest film. He said, Clive, I'm here for five minutes. And that's it. <laughs> he was lovely. He was really funny. Well, isn't that amazing that you you still remember the people who yeah. were a that funny? Why do we love funny people so much? I find it very interesting. You you probably met far more comedians than I have, um, but I've interviewed a few, and mostly that funny people can be really serious, and and they regard comedy as a very serious business. And a lot of them are quite introverted. You, occasionally you get the real extrovert and they just a laugh a minute. And I find them quite exhausting in a way. Um, but but they're also very, very serious comedians. Um, and I I don't know whether that, that's a necessity. If, you, if you're if you going to be a comedian, you've got to be kind of uh, analytical like that. The only one I met who was just exactly as I was expecting, talking of big stars, was Eric Morecambe who I interviewed a long, long time ago. And I don't know whether he was putting on an act, but all the way through, even waiting in reception, he was just entertaining everybody, doing all the glasses and everything, all the way through, had everybody rolling about. I don't know whether he just switched it on or not, but it looked like that was really him. Well, that that's funny because I uh, have an Eric Morecambe story as well, which really? is... Um, um, my best friend's dad was William G. Stewart, who, oh. you, who 15 to 1, but he was a, yeah. a producer, a comedy yeah. producer. And he produced David Frost's show live from London. And it went out live in Australia, but they recorded it here. So everybody did the show so they didn't have to fly 24 hours to promote their book or TV series or whatever. And uh, I was in the green room at Capitol Studios, which you probably know. And uh, it just so happened that, as you know, in green rooms, you just end up talking to the person beside you. And just me and Eric Morecambe were talking to each other. And uh, we're having a, a, a laugh, basically, about football. And he couldn't have been sweeter. And he's a big Luton Town fan. And suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw this woman approaching, who was obviously from the audience, who'd managed to get backstage. And she sidled up to us and went, I'm so sorry to disturb you both. I I, I just couldn't leave without uh, coming up to you, Mr. Morecambe, and saying thank you for all the years of pleasure you've given me and my family. And I just couldn't leave. I'm so sorry to have disturbed you. And he was so lovely and humble and warm. And as she backed away, apologising profusely, he turned to me and I'm the only person there, did the thing with his glasses and went... Seems like a nice young man. <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah, what, so, so what I say is I don't think that he was putting it on. I think he was just generally warm, funny and lovely. Who makes you laugh? I think what mostly makes me laugh and not so much. I mean, there are one or two great stars that I think are, are hilarious. Um, but often it's it's more reality that uh, is really funny, you know, real people, real situations, awkwardness. Um, that that I find uh, really makes me laugh out loud in a way that a lot of things that are funny kind of just gently amusing. You said that, that realness, is there a real funny story about something that happened to you that, that, that you know, gets into your sense of humour? Well, I, t- I think what happens with me is, I mean, a lot of it is on the air. It's, it's the you know, people phoning in, 
the the unexpected moment. There have been lots and lots of those over the years. Um, yeah, like in the early days when I was doing uh, doing the overnight program, the number of times I'd be chatting away to somebody at half past three in the morning, and and uh, and I'd be going and and Harry, what well, what do you think about that? And you'd fade the fader back up, and you'd hear. <laughs> And that, and every time it's it, it was hilarious that the, partly because it's sort of it's self-deprecating because they've fallen asleep because uh, because they're listening to me, but also it's just going to happen that time in the morning. And there's something hysterical about somebody who is waiting on the line to speak to you, or is listening to you, and then you fade up the fader and they've uh, actually nodded off. So a lot of lot of those like real real situations I find. And the other thing I find funny is when you're not supposed to laugh. Um, so that's that for me is like a real tonic. Um, and in your, if you're in the studio, especially if you're doing something serious and you're not meant to laugh, um, like uh, I'm just trying to think of a, there was a very early call I had. I think we were doing a phone in about um, uh, unusual jobs. And this woman phones in talking about her husband and the job that she used to do. And it, it was quite a comical tale she was telling of uh, of how he used to work down the sewers and he had these huge trousers, sewer socks, she called them, and they came up to here. And it was, and, and it, they were all sort of just uh, gently smiling away. And then she said, and then he caught a disease and died. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, and it's... Uh, well, it's true because I shouldn't be laughing, but my no, automatic I, reaction it, it was, was to laugh. And it was terrible, terrible, but it was so funny. And the way she said it um, was so sort of matter of fact. Uh, and you, you can actually hear in my, oh, well, I'm sorry to hear about that. And, and, and you know, but it's the fact everyone else is rolling around and you definitely cannot because it would be so inappropriate. And that, I don't, it's, it's an amazing feeling, actually, when you, you can't help yourself laugh and it really I don't know about you but it doesn't happen that often um but uh uh it's it's a real tonic in a way it's like a physical thing isn't it yeah it's well it's laughing in church I think it was always called wasn't yeah. it which it, it, yeah. the inappropriateness of yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. but, uh, yeah. but I had I had a thing that Ainsley and I were at Westminster Abbey for the Commonwealth Day and we we went to school together and we became schoolboys because we were seated right opposite the whole of the royal family. And, and we were just and this just became hilarious to us that the two boys who went to school together would be in this situation. And we just couldn't stop laughing. It was, you know, it was the perfect setup, really. Um, but going back to that laughing at that, they say that um comedy is tragedy verse uh, plus time mm. so yes things are funny if you you have a distance from them or you have yes. that uh, yeah, yeah. A absolutely and it takes a little while but uh, eventually you can laugh at almost anything yeah is everyone funny well i certainly met some people who, who i haven't found very funny um <laughs> but they I guess sometimes unintentionally funny um, that even the most serious person can be funny without realizing it. I don't think everybody's got a gift to be funny. There are some people who are just naturally gifted. I don't know. Can you learn it? I, 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 I'm not sure whether you can, to be honest. I think you might be able to learn a few techniques, but really I just, there are some people who are just naturally funny and it, everything they say, you could have exactly the same lines. And when they say it, it's funny. Well, I'm very interested that you talk about can you learn it? Because obviously uh, I'm very interested in how you can teach it. I think everybody on their dating profile puts good sense of humour. Mm. But that's not true, is it, really? No. And it, I think going there, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink, essentially. I think that the, one of the few things that you cannot teach is the timing of where mm. the funny comes. What, what do you think yeah. about that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely right. Timing is um, is vital. And I don't, yeah, I, I, I think it, it is a, 
a, a natural thing. It's um, I, w I certainly wouldn't claim to be naturally funny. I have my odd moments, but um, but they're few and far between. So <laughs> don't get your hopes up for this. Uh, hard time. <laughs> now, I've listened to your show over the years, Clive, and I know you are very, very droll and very, very funny. But people have a different style which yeah. is what make, makes it interesting. My friend Jackie Green, who is the uh, queen of PR on Broadway in America, has a phrase I like, which is be smart, be funny or be quiet. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's a vital thing, actually, is knowing when not to try to be funny. Uh, I mean, I can't really tell jokes i never remember jokes i can't re even remember funny stories i can spot i think when something is funny um and as i say occasionally it happens and that's great and you can kind of uh bring out that moment but there's awful i think i'm quite good at filtering out so that if it personally i think it's better to if you're not sure it's going to be funny don't do it that's the smart bit you know i yeah, mean i think exactly. yeah yeah and I, I mean, I, I do think, you know, listening to you and um, having got to know you, I do think you're funny. But this, the smart bit of it is knowing not to do it. Mm -hmm. I think the, mm -hmm. I, I, you've you've worked with a lot of um, business people over the years and the business leader who goes out to make the speech and goes, I have to start with a gag. Mm -hmm. And you know how clawing that is, don't you? Have you seen those kind of people try it and not succeed? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and it's it's the the trying is the uh, uh, is the mistake, I think. I mean, I've had I haven't met that many business people except to work with. I've got I've had lots of bosses, and um, and I would say. For the, again, I'm not going to mention any names. They're, all, all the really good ones are actually naturally funny. They have a sort of humour about them. They're not necessarily telling jokes, but uh, they do it with a sense of humour. And not only around the office, but also in sort of formal situations as well. But I mean, actually, I will mention one. Um, Richard Park is uh, uh, one of the most senior kind of radio bosses in the country. And... He's he's actually quite a, a, a fearsome personality. He's got an amazing attention to detail. But he's also just really funny. And I don't know how he does it because he's actually he can be like a um, uh, like a stand up comedian. So we'll have big company meetings and he will. Actually, he's got the confidence to do it. What is terrible is if you do it and, and, and it doesn't work. But if you've got the confidence, you can carry it off. He actually is somebody. Who, who is genuinely funny, but manages to combine it with uh, an absolute attention to detail. Whereas there are lots of people who are funny, especially comedians, I think, who, um, are, who are completely hopeless when it comes to business. What would the world be like without humour? Oh, terrible, obviously. Uh, I mean, it would just be uh we, we'd all be kind of machines really wouldn't we i think i think we're in danger of going that way but uh yeah it, it would be almost unbearable wouldn't it i mean even in the, the the worst situations you need that little little smile and the uh the the unpredictable moments do you think that that's what because uh, you've obviously you know been around politics reported on politics uh for years do you think that that's the difference that that, that it makes at that level of likability for politicians or business people, or, you know, is that, does that humanize mm -hmm. someone? Yeah, I, yes, I think that's right. And I mean, politicians are a fascinating example, really, aren't they? Because you've got uh, like Theresa May, who was, who was the Maybot, who I'm sure in real life, maybe she has a sense of humour, but she just could not get that across. And people didn't like her. She didn't have that likability. She didn't seem to have a sense of humour or a lightness of touch. It was all so kind of formal and, and serious. And then you've got the other extreme, Boris Johnson, 
who who is a joker who plays up to it and uh, but actually doesn't seem to have any attention to detail and is in many ways dreadful um, for for the opposite reason. So it's a yeah, it's really difficult. And politicians, I find, having interviewed many over the years, is they yeah you know, they could all do with a little bit of of a light touch and a little joke here and there, but they are terrified because if they get something wrong and it goes goes pear shaped, they're, they're all terrified of what they say now because we pick up on the smallest thing and and, and it backfires. Well, you talked earlier on about self deprecation and in, in humor, and I think you're very good at that. Would that be something that you would recommend to politicians or business people alike? Or is it dangerous um, to, to go to uh, have too much of that? I, I, I think uh, I think it's all right, actually, because if you're certainly if you're the leader, you're the boss, then a bit of self-deprecation doesn't do any harm at all. I think that's better than I mean, a lot of humor is obviously at the expense of other people and I, I guess you know if you're a leader of a group of people you don't really want to um to have the humor at their expense um because it's about keeping your your, your team together isn't it so uh, i i no i don't think there's anything wrong with a bit of self-deprecation so is that the difference between uh, punching up and punching down yeah, yeah. I mean, or you can punch sideways out at, you know, you can punch your yourself, or company or whatever, uh, punch yourself a little bit, but probably not too much at, at your sort of uh, colleagues who are, you're working with. Do you think you talk about colleagues, do you think people laugh enough in the workplace or has it become very staid and serious? I do think it is really important to do that. Um up to up to a point there's a sort of nice balance isn't there where uh, i have been in one or two workplaces over the years where it's all been a bit too jokey and i haven't actually liked that it's like the whole thing we're just here for a laugh um and that's that's not right i think you've got to be serious about the job but do it in uh, in a kind of good humored way and there's a, there's a very delicate balance there and it's a really skilled boss and as i say i've had many of those who, who just about they've managed to get that right that you can, there's a nice kind of relaxed atmosphere, but you focus on the job at the same time. That's, uh, I mean, but that's an art, isn't it? It's not mm. really a science. It's more of the the, the art of, yeah. of, of, when you look at the, the people who've done it well, and you mentioned Richard Park earlier on, um, what are they doing that's different and better? I guess it's a sort of productivity thing, you know, that um, that if you get the right atmosphere, then people will want to work more. Um, and yeah, as I say, I've had many, actually some very, very funny bosses over the years, some who are just not not cracking jokes all the time, but they do they, they do things with a wry smile, a little twinkle in the eye. And I think especially when you're working with a lot of younger people as well, a lot of producers and uh, and the reporters coming coming up through the ranks it needs to be an enjoyable experience and it's a it's a very delicate balance i don't know what the secret is to it but I, I've, you can see when it works and you can see when it doesn't and if people are kind of living in fear then that doesn't work uh, it's interesting isn't it because i you know i think it's so instinctive but you would think that at the harvard business school you could write a business case mm -hmm. Yeah. for uh, humor if you had to do that what kind of things do you think would be in that business case mm, that is really hard isn't it because it's not something that you can you can buy very easily i mean it's it's not something you can kind of put in a bottle and 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 sell to people uh so i mean the business case for humor is is huge i would have thought because if you get it right, you can win people over. I mean, uh, one person standing on a stage can fill a stadium with this weird thing that is comedy, and it's just them. And it, it they have the skill to make a load of people laugh, and and it's incredible. But to you, you can't really. I, well, personally, I don't think there's a, exactly a science to it. As you say, you can kind of uh, develop it a little bit, but 
But when it's good, it's worth an absolute fortune. Well, here's something that, uh, because I'm intrigued by this, obviously, because the book and the podcast is all around this. But I, here's something that I notice about you, which I think would be in the business case right near the top, is listening. In, mm. in order to be good at humour, you have to listen. I mean, listening off the top as well. You know, mm. not just with the ears, but with the eyes. Is it appropriate? Do people give you the signals to be able to play, yeah. for want of a better word? So yes. Could you talk about, because you've, your whole career, one faction of it is built on listening, is it not? Mm. It absolutely is. Um, and that's why I said I'm probably better at asking the questions than than answering them. Um, and I'm not sure what the answer to that is. I don't know. But you're absolutely right. It is. It, I mean, most of my job is about listening and listening carefully and knowing the moment when it might be funny, but mostly it isn't funny. But then you knowing the moment when you want to argue. Um, yeah. Yeah. You've got to listen closely to what people are saying and, and pick up on, as you say, the cues of uh, I mean, I, I think I've spoken to so many people on the phone over the years that I can I can tell pretty quickly. I mean, you mentioned um, Peter Cook earlier on um, and uh, he, I think, um, really stood out because I, I can spot a, uh, a jokey caller. I can spot a fake caller pretty quickly now because I, there's, I've heard so many over the years you you can tell when, when it's somebody ringing up as a prank um and i can tell probably within 10 seconds um and normally they they sort of fade away and put the phone down or giggle or give it all away and the, the, well, the, what was different about peter cook of course was that he phoned up as a as a fake caller playing characters um but was brilliant at it and when you what you do when somebody rings in as a and they're not real, you you test them, and you you ask them questions to to see well, uh, do they really think that? And well, where are they now? And and just 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 check out that they've got a proper backstory. And he had an answer for everything because he was just a master improviser, and 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 almost said, bring it on, you know, ask me more, ask me more, and I will. Uh, and, and he. It fleshed out this whole character, which then turned turned into a uh, almost a series. But it that's what made me suspicious. I mean, I didn't know it was Peter Cook to begin with, but that's what made me suspicious that it must be a professional because normally they just giggle and put the phone down. Well, no, no. I mean, but those are classics. And didn't he, was one of his characters Sven? Was it? Yes, that's... yes, that was his main character, Sven from Swiss Cottage. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Utah, his his girlfriend who he was having marital problems with or romantic problems at least I don't know whether they got married in the end but you see this is why I think that you don't quite appreciate how good you are with comedy and with humor because you're being self-deprecating about that but for Peter Cook to recognize that you could as we call it in comedy play is a huge thing. So you get it. It may not be that you are always delivering the comedy line, mm. but the feed, as yes. in the old double act, is as important as that. Yeah. Well, yes, I think that you know, it's a huge compliment that he that he called up and that, uh, you know, I could be effectively a straight man and um, and allow him to uh, to do this. And I think it was from what I've since read and, and met him a few times uh, uh, over the years, I think he was at a stage in his career where he really needed to uh, some kind of platform to do it um, because he wasn't really doing anything at the time. And it was half past three in the morning and uh, he suddenly found an audience. But he, he found an audience, but he also found... Uh, a kindred spirit, essentially, of somebody he could play with. And I think that in humour is really important to understand, you know, how it works. It's an ebb and flow. It's a timing. It's not stepping on his lines. No, you know? ab absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 
and and phone in actually in the middle of the night where you can you can get away with much more than during the daytime uh it is like the perfect platform for it because it is almost improvisation anybody who's listening to this uh, they should uh, hunt it down i don't know where it's available now but you can tell us if it yeah, is yeah they are on on youtube i believe and not not due to me but there are uh, there are peter cook fans out there i think if you google sven and peter cook the, there's about 10 calls or so that uh, they're all very scratchy and medium wave because it was all a long time ago but they they're very entertaining and you can just tell um that he uh, he he was having a bit of a ball one of the things uh, which you will know from all comedians and everything is comedy sometimes crosses the line. Have you, have you ever got into a situation whereby you've crossed the line with your comedy? No, I don't think so. I think I'm pretty good at, because it's almost everything I do is on the air anyway. Um, I've, you, you develop a kind of built in filter. So I'm, I'm pretty careful I mean, there, there are the odd things where it goes wrong, like the poor lady with the sewer socks, um, where you put your foot in it. But mostly, um, I'm pretty careful. And as I say, I mean, a lot of what we do now is, is much more serious. And there's just little moments of, of humour that, uh, that that lighten the mood. But no, I personally, I think it's really important to know when not to do something. I know that there are those that push the boundaries all the time. No, I think I think I know that um, you know Ofcom will will be listening and people nowadays you could put one foot wrong and there's 300 people on Twitter telling you that you've uh, you've done it wrong. Wow, yeah, well, I mean, gosh, that kind of self-discipline you know, to actually not put a foot wrong. Come on, Clive, there must have been an early broadcast. Oh, I'm yes, yeah. I mean, I'm sure there are lots of things. I I, I mean, I I feel I get things wrong every single day and that's what you know, one of the things that keeps me going really is that it's 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 live and it's unpredictable you, you don't know what's going to happen each program and i never quite get it right and i always i'm very hard on myself and i always think um after a program oh, should have done this should have done that it wasn't i'll do better next time but well, that's really interesting for, because every um, businessman of, of note and we've got, you know, billionaires coming on this podcast, uh, people in comedy, people in entertainment, anybody who does really well tends to have that attitude. Very few people go, yeah, it's fine. It's gone. It was it was fun. Everybody's very harsh on themselves. And I think that's that's a trait mm -hmm. of successful people. I mean, do you think do you find that? having met a lot of successful people and worked with them, do you find they're all thinking in that similar fashion? Uh, largely, yes. Um, all the, I mean, there are one or two people who, uh, you know, they think, right, I've made it and don't have to try hard anymore. But very few, to be honest. I, I think um, I personally uh, am quite hard on myself, but I'm also quite, nervous and anxious i'm an anxious sort of person anyway so i all even now after quite a few years i don't know how many even now but quite a few years of being on the radio i still go into the studio thinking oh it might not work and what if nobody calls in this this could be the time when nobody calls in and i honestly think that every time um and but I think I think you need a bit of that to well I do some people probably just got the confidence but it, it's sort of that little bit of anxiety it, it keeps you on your toes. Yeah, I I I couldn't agree more. Actually, I think when you lose that, I think you lose an edge. Mm. You want mm. the uh, I mean, let's just call it the butterflies. You know, when yeah. I work yeah. with rugby um, great Welsh rugby great uh, Scott Quinnell. He would always talk about the butterflies. You'll you'll always have butterflies in your stomach, yeah. but they'll turn into dragons. And you know, <laughs> you use that. And yeah. and I think most performers, and by the way, I I think performance is, you know, you perform in business, you perform in entertainment, you, you perform in sport. Most performers need that to to get them uh, to yeah. that next level. Yes. Yeah, I mean, sport, especially, I would have thought. I mean, I'm no sports person, but but you've got to be a little bit on edge and ready to go, haven't you? I mean, the adrenaline's got to be there. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, have you ever gotten yourself out of trouble by using humour? I, I think my, as I say, my way of not getting into trouble is that, uh, well, the only thing I have got, apart from my mental filter, which is, you know, don't get sued and don't get fined by the uh, the authorities, uh, we do also have a dump button. Um, at a uh, there's on all live phone-ins pretty much, um, certainly in commercial radio, you've got a button that you can press and it removes five or 10 seconds worth of what you've just said. And uh, so it's not my skill, but the skill of knowing when to press the button, if in doubt, I press it anyway. And uh, you'll just hear this weird jump back in, uh, in, in time to cut out what somebody said, either trying to be funny or be libelous or whatever. So that is, that's just heaven sent, the dump button. Yeah, well, by the way, for the Humorology podcast, the words dump button are heaven sent as well. Yes, <laughs> yeah, you probably cut out loads of those rude words that I said earlier, haven't you? <laughs> exactly, I can't believe you said all those things earlier. They're, they're, no, I, I don't uh, apologise. Producer Simon will be pressing the dump yeah. button constantly. Uh, so, uh, you reminded me of um, actually the dump button. Um, the time that we uh, had to press it the most was uh, John Cooper Clark, I think it was, the poet. John and uh, I'm pretty sure it was him. If it's not, you'll have to cut this whole bit out. But I'm <laughs> sure it was him. And I'll look it up because it was in the, in, in, in the papers. Um, but he, he came on and, and I asked him to read one of his poems. Um, somewhat foolishly the uh because there were two versions of this poem and one one had the f word in it uh every other word so the effing this the effing that the effing that the, and it was just a, it was quite a magnificent poem but it was full of expletives and um, this was not at all allowed under uh, broadcasting rules um so we pressed you press the button but then you carried carry on reading it out oh, for it. so you press it again and then you press it again and uh and what the listener heard was just the effing and then a little jump and then another effing and then another effing and eventually <laughs> the producer had to come out and, and actually ask him to leave the studio oh, um so it doesn't always save you uh, when dump buttons go wrong exactly yes you on yes. channel five <laughs> In but if, this, if you leave this bit in about John Cooper Clark, uh, I, I am. If anyone's hearing this now, it'll be because uh, I've checked it and it was him. If it wasn't, none of this will be included. Oh, that's right. Well, by the way, I absolutely adore John Cooper Clark's Me uh, too. poetry. He's fantastic. I, yeah, he is. He is a genius, which hopefully will stop us both getting sued if it's yes. not true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in business, is it survival of the fittest or survival of the funniest? Mm. I got to say, I mean, I'm sure this is going to be your your theme, and it's certainly from what we've said, but it's it's got to be a bit of both, hasn't it? I mean, you've you've got to have uh, a bit of a sense of humour, I think, um, but you've also got to know what you're doing at the same time because you know I've met business people who are. Uh, hilarious but terrible at business and people who are really brilliant at business but rub people up the wrong way and uh, I think if you can get that mix right and I do see as I say I've had lots of bosses who, who managed to get that mix right and I also see a lot of the younger sort of entrepreneurs who I've interviewed over the last few years who are more in the kind of digital business space they do seem to have quite a, a more modern kind of chilled attitude so they managed to combine a real sort of uh, attention to detail, specifics, a business sense, but also a kind of relaxed, easygoing attitude at the same time. And if uh, I think that's the kind of perfect combination, uh, uh, you know, the wry smile, a little, little bit of a joke, but um, but also you've got to know what you're doing. And and timing as well, knowing when to do it, which is, you know, comes back to your extraordinary skill set of knowing when to shut up and when to say something that's uh, i mean i think that in business that's really useful as well isn't it can i speak now 
Was this the moment? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my clues just, uh, I lost it there. <laughs> yeah, you well, say? yeah, well, thanks, thanks for showing me up. <laughs> <laughs> no, superb. What were we talking about? <laughs> yeah, now you're going to show me up as being the worst interviewer in the world. Not the worst all. interviewer interviews <laughs> the best interviewer in the world. And and all kinds of hilarity ensues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, go on. No, but it's it, it, I think that, that the ability to do that is is probably one of the biggest abilities in life is mm -hmm. to do. Yeah. And I just wanted you to just slightly expand on that for me of, of how you do it and any advice you'd give to somebody, whether that's in radio presenting or whether that's in business about what you do. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head earlier on about actually listening and, and picking up on the kind of social cues. And uh, um, it, it's, it's communication in the end, isn't it? Um, and there's a lot of people who I mean, in interviewing, we're talking about interviewing at the moment. The most important thing, as you know, is is with interviewing is to listen to the answers. But it's extraordinary how many people don't. And, and it works as a conversation because I'm picking up on what you're saying. You're picking up on what I'm saying. But, it, it, you know, if you you don't listen to the answers and then I mean, in the early days, I've made that mistake. And I've just got my five questions on a piece of paper. And I don't realize that question number two has already been answered well, the answer to number one, and then you sound a complete idiot. And it, I know it sounds basic, but listening is is crucial. And um, using what you hear the first time to inform your your next question. Yeah, and right. I think that's useful in in life and in business. Yeah. I mean, if you're interviewing somebody for a job, you know, don't yeah. just you yeah. know, I I've been privy to so many job interviews when they they've called me in for advice and people are like you say just reading off a list. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Extraordinary. Uh, we're going to into the section we like to call quick fire questions. Oh crikey. Who's the funniest person in business that you've met? Um funny person in business oh i don't know i haven't met that many people in business apart from the ones i've worked for so uh all my all my uh, amusing bosses especially richard park well it, he's hilarious um but very very serious at the same time okay uh what book makes you laugh let me think i've just read uh, brian bilston do you know brian bilston he's like the twitter poet laureate and uh, he comes up with these lovely little sort of twitter poems and he's just written a book called Diary of a Somebody, and it's just of the moment. So I'd highly recommend that. Very funny. Actually made me laugh. Great. What film makes you laugh? I The last time I really laughed out loud, I just re-watched um, Alpha Piper, Alan Partridge. Um, anybody who works in radio uh, loves Alan Partridge, <laughs> partly because we're fearful that we're turning into him. And <laughs> you, you've got to kind of try and resist being being uh, accidental partridge but yeah his his lampooning of radio is so spot on it's brilliant oh i i love it as well what word makes you laugh um sausages <laughs> <laughs> See, it, I, I, it does work actually i was thinking dump button's going to be the dump button. yeah is one word dump button you used to um, prof for profanity Oh, did it? They changed the label on the button to uh, to dump now, which actually dump sounds more comical, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It? The slightly serious note, what's not funny? Trying to be funny when it's not, you know, the, you're talking about bosses. You don't want to go down the Ricky Gervais line, uh, which, uh, you know, is of course, he's making it funny because it's not funny. But uh, and puns. Puns. Never do puns. Oh, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Puns. Terrible. Never funny. Terrible. Don't, don't um, do puns. Would you rather be considered clever or funny? Um, I'd rather be considered either of those. <laughs> and, <laughs> You'll uh, take anything. Yeah, I'll take whatever's going. Yes. Clever, funny, preferably a bit of both. I just, yes, just like to be considered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I'm on, you know, in the top hundred uh, of either of those, that'd be marvellous. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Desert Island Gags. 
if you could only take one joke with you to a desert island, what would it be? Oh, blimey. Somebody told me one, reminded me of one yesterday, um, which, if I can remember it, it's what's, uh, what's orange and sounds like a parrot. I don't know. What's orange and sounds like a parrot? Carrot. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's that's the last joke that somebody told me uh, yesterday, and um, beyond that, I, I literally I must have heard millions of jokes. I can't remember any of them. A friend of mine, actually somebody you know, uh, told me that joke, reminded me of that joke because they won a uh, weirdly a um, a pound of sausages by telling that joke, because uh, we went into a butcher's and it said um, free sausages if you can tell us a joke. And that's the one he told, and he oh. won sausages as a result. That's it, you see? So you have the funniest word yep. and the funniest joke in one yep. story. Well, true that's story, funny. not necessarily funny, but true. <laughs> well, it's been an absolute pleasure, Clive. Thank you so much for sharing all your good humour on the Humorology podcast. Oh, thank you, Paul. It's, it's Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.